Oh, anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday? So glad to be here. So glad that you're here. And I'm, I'm honored to bring the word of the Lord today. And um, it, it's, it really is a privilege. And I, I love your pastors so much. Um, just the way that... God has used Pastor Ron and Kelly to bless our life and to be an encouragement, to be a voice, and um, I, I really do love and appreciate them so much. It's an honor to be back here. It's an honor to preach the Word of God to you, and um, I celebrate all that uh, God has done through them over the these last few years, and I'm also so excited about what God is going to continue to do in this great church. How many know the best days of the assembly are still way out in front of us? Come on, somebody. And um, Pastor Ron, Pastor Kelly, we love you. We honor you. Can we celebrate our pastors? Come on, put your hands together. I want to thank you for helping us, uh, sowing into us. Last year I was here in May, and you guys sowed into our life and into our church, and it was so incredibly generous. We were believing God at that point to buy land. And um, right now, land in Vegas is selling for about $1.2 million an acre. Praise the Lord. <laughs> don't whistle too loud. It's like, don't kill my faith, okay? Well, guess what? We, uh, we were able to, at the, at the end of last year, we were able to negotiate and uh, and do that. And so since we last talked and since you last sowed into our life, we were able to buy, I think I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, we were able to buy six acres in the heart of Las Vegas. Can somebody praise the Lord with me? Since we purchased this land, uh, it has doubled in value. My CFO, every time we talk about it, he goes, please don't sell this land. Please, we got to build a building. I said, we're not going to sell the land. We're not, I'm not a flipper, okay? I'm a church builder. We have bought land, and those, those papers that you see me signing is not only the papers that we bought the land, but our construction loan from our bank, which, by the way, our bank is here in the Tulsa area in Owasso, and um, so we love them, and... Uh, and I love Tulsa even more now. Amen. And so, uh, but we bank with them and they're also giving us the construction loan. It is a $15.5 million project. We're a four-year-old church. It is a miracle. To God be the glory. And can I tell you, you are a part of that miracle. We are now the most unchurched city in America. And so we need more churches in Vegas. You're a part of it. Your seat is a part of it. It's a 35,000 square foot building that will seat 1,000 worshipers, as well as state-of-the-art, world-class kids ministry, lobbies, all that kind of stuff. And so, to God be the glory. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sowing into it. And whatever you give today, every penny you give today goes right into City Light Church and uh, will continue helping us. Uh, you know, we're, people are unchurched in our, in our city. We've seen now seven uh, 7,500 people come to Christ in four years at our church, 7,500. Just last week, just last week, 93 people gave their lives to Christ. The week before that, uh, over 70 people water baptized. This Tuesday night, I had a, uh, a night where we taught on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Over 150 people received the baptism in the Spirit, prayed in tongues. As the Spirit gave them the utterance. Amen. So God is moving. And, uh, but, but we've been able to do what we've done because of the financial support of some of our big brother churches that have partnered with us. And so um, while we're teaching all those unsaved people in Vegas how to tithe, amen. So, uh, so I appreciate you. I'm going to look at one scripture this is John chapter 11. It's a famous scripture where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And we're in a series called Altars right now here at the assembly. And I want to, I want to kind of lean into that moment with you. And I'm going to be talking about the power of prayer and some ingredients to prayer that are going to be necessary uh, to see miracles and breakthroughs in your life. This is John chapter 11, verse 32. The Bible says when Mary reached the place where Jesus was. So, so this is Jesus at the burial grounds 
at the tomb of Lazarus. And when she sees him, here is her greeting to Jesus. Not a great way to start a conversation with the Lord. Lord, if you had been here, <laughs> my brother would not have died. Jesus would go on to say now in verse 40, Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have heard me. Look it over at a neighbor right around you and tell him God has heard your prayer. Come on, tell him that. God has heard your prayer. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I want to preach from this subject today, waiting for a miracle. Waiting for a miracle. Father, I pray you speak now in a very particular and powerful way to your people. I thank you, Lord, that you are, you're bigger than my study, you're bigger than my talent, you're bigger than my gifting, you're bigger than my preparation. So I pray, Holy Spirit, come right now and speak a tailor-made word to your people in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody with faith said aloud, amen, amen. and amen, and amen. I love this passage because to me it's such a picture of prayer. There's so many things we can learn about our own prayer life as we look at this story. And I do want to remind you this morning that God does hear and answer prayer. Give me a good amen right there. God, God hears and answers prayer. Our God is a prayer answering God. He said, call unto me and I will answer you. You talk to me, I'll talk to you. And I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. God said there are mysteries revealed in prayer, wisdom given in prayer, strategies released in prayer, that there is a life that you can live that is only found in the place of prayer, that it is not available just to Christians, but it is available to Christians who pray, that when you pray, God speaks. When you talk to God, God talks to you. When you seek God, God responds. When you draw near, God draws near to you. And he said, and I will reveal things that you do not know. There is a life you do not know. There is strategy you do not know. There is wisdom you do not know. There are ideas for your life that you do not know. The will of God is discovered. The plan of God is discovered. The purpose of God for your life is discovered and it is discovered in the place of prayer. That prayer is the access point to the kingdom of God. Prayer doesn't give you everything you want. You don't just get to pray your lust and get it. That's not what I'm talking about. Prayer is not a genie in a bottle. But anything you ever expect to get from God will only come through prayer. Prayer is God's invitation for us to come into alignment with his plan and purpose in the earth. Prayer. Prayer is powerful. Prayer will change your life. You become a person of prayer and you will not recognize yourself in six months. Jesus goes in Mark chapter 9 to a young boy who is, he's, he's sick, he's ill, he's, he's bound with different spirits and demons. And the Bible said that Jesus went to him and he healed him and he set him free and he delivered him. And the disciples could not do this. What, what the disciples could not do, Jesus did. So the disciples said, Lord, why, why were you able to do that? We weren't able to do that. Think about the response of Jesus. He said, this comes out by prayer and fasting. Jesus did not say, oh, I was able to heal him because I'm the son of God and you're not. Jesus did not say, well, I healed him because I'm deity and you're humanity. Jesus did not say it's because I have a special relationship with the Father that you'll never have. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I pray and you don't. Huh. That some things only happen by prayer. That the marriage you want will only come by prayer. That, 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 the, that the ideas that you want to step into will only happen by prayer. That the business that you want to run will only happen by prayer. That there is a life that can only be discovered in the place when you build an altar to God and you connect with God in the supernatural. That is where your life will really be discovered and the will of God will really be released in your life. God is in inviting you. God is inviting this church and God is calling this nation back to prayer, back to seeking his face. And he said, when you talk to me, I'm going to talk back to you. 
Come on, anybody believe in the power of prayer on a Sunday? I still believe that when we pray in the name of Jesus, all things are possible. So here, here's a few things we got to know about, about prayer. And here's the first one. Patience is required. I didn't get one amen. I got three nervous laughs. That's all right. I'll take it. Did you hear it? Just, I said, patience is required. Somebody said, oh. <laughs> I'm going to have to kill this sermon before we resurrect it, okay? So get ready. Point one is not going to be fun, but stay with me. I promise you'll leave in Kurtz. Patience is required. Here's what the scripture said. The scripture said Lazarus was sick. And Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus. Lazarus, whom you love, your best friend. Most likely one of Jesus' top financial givers said, he's sick. And they expected Jesus to immediately drop everything and go to him. And the Bible says instead, Jesus waited two extra days before he went to Bethany. And I just want to tell you, there's going to be a lot of times in your life that when you pray, you're going to expect an immediate thing to change. And you will find many times that God will wait. And it's not fun. But he's doing something. Uh, there's two reasons Jesus waited. Number one, theologians tell us that there was probably a mob in Bethany waiting for Jesus. And when Jesus and his disciples would have come into Bethany, there would have been a war. There would have been a riot. They would have tried to kill Jesus. So number one, Jesus had to wait for that mob to move out, number one. Number two, Jesus wanted to show that he had authority over death. He wanted to get the people to see that he was not, he couldn't just heal the sick. He was the resurrection and the life. Here's my point. When Jesus waited, he had a purpose. When Jesus tells you to wait, he has a purpose. <laughs> a lot of times we're playing checkers and God is playing chess. Now I'm from Belen, New Mexico. Chess never made it down to New Mexico. Amen. Amen. But I've heard it's difficult. I'm still a, I'm still a checkers man. Amen. King me. Okay, that's my... That's my that's, that's where my intellect stops. Here's my point. When we pray, we, we pray with an expected end, but we don't understand the process that God is going to do that's going to bring him the most glory and is going to bring you the most good, and it will require patience. And when, and when he doesn't just respond with an immediate yes, understand that he's, got, he's, he's working things for your good. He's working things for your favor. He's working things for your testimony. And so patience will be required. Um, I, I've, I've heard it said that God is never early. He's never late. He's right on time. I've just discovered he's never early. He's never late. He's just always on his time. I found this out about my wife, by the way. We've been married 16 years. She's still on her own time. Her 10 minutes and my 10 minutes are not the same. My 10 minutes are based off of a clock. I'm not going to tell you what hers are based off of, but it's different. And you know what? You can pray in tongues and you can talk in tongues and you can bind the devil and you can cast out and you can loose and you can bind and you can plead the blood and you can anoint with oil and you can declare and you can speak to mountains. And at the end of the day, I don't care how much you pray or how loud you pray or how much you give in the offering, God is still on his time and you're not going to get God on your time. Prayer does not get God on my side. Prayer gets me on God's side. And can I tell you, my wife and I no longer fight about time. Because I learned <laughs> that if I want to fight her about being late, I'm going to lose every time. So I'm just, I'm just cool being 15, 15 minutes late. We just going to walk in late. God bless you. Because I'm not, not going to, 16 years later, I'm not going to get her on my time. Is this like a marriage sermon right now? I feel like I'm talking to husbands right now. I feel like husbands are going, you're Morse coding me right now. But the women are praising the Lord. Can I just tell you? And I don't care if I go to the car and I honk. and ah, ah, We're the pastors. We got to be on time. It don't matter. She's on her own time. Now I'm, just happy. now I'm just casually late everywhere I go. And I love it. Can I tell you the moment you finally embrace, I'm not going to get God on my time clock. But I can find his rhythm. 
and I can be okay in the waiting. Here's what the Bible says. Those who wait on the Lord. There's a way you can wait where you get stronger. There's a way that you can wait where you don't get bitter and frustrated. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I'm mounting up with wings like eagles. I'll run and not be weary. I'll walk and not be faint. There's a way that I can wait with expectation, believing God to do something. I can wait with a good attitude and I can see God do something in my life. Waiting time is not wasted time. And if God's not in a hurry, I got to stop striving. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says it like this. Imitate those through faith and patience inherit the promises of God imitate those with faith and patience faith and patience I have found that most people do not inherit the promises of God and it's not because of a lack of faith it's because of a lack of patience they had the faith to believe for it but they didn't have the patience to endure it can I tell you, my own life, walking with Jesus now for 24 years, the mistakes I've made have, have usually never been because of a lack of faith. They've been because of a lack of patience. Because I wasn't able to wait long enough for the promise of God. Because the promises of God are inherited. That means that I don't decide the timeline he does. Patience is long-term faith. Never forget this. Patience is long-term faith. Patience is the ability to believe God for a long time. Patience is the ability to believe God past the emotion of the moment. Now, I believe in emotions. I like emotions. I'm an emotional guy. I cry at TV commercials. Come on, somebody. I watch cartoons with my, with my six-year-old daughter, and I get choked up. Okay, I'm an emotional guy, so I'm not against emo. I'm a Pentecostal. Okay, I feel God. <laughs> I hear God. I love God. I'm, 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 all, I'm all about it. But patience is the ability to have faith past the feeling. Sundays are important because Sundays boost your faith. Sundays, there's an emotional element to it. It's the praises of God. It's clapping. It's shouting. It's crying. It's praising. It's, it's, it's being with the people. Of, it's beautiful. There's an emotion to it. But I need faith, so, so I'm going to have faith on Sunday, but I need to have patience by Thursday. I told you I was going to kill this sermon. I told you I was going, don't worry, we're going to resurrect it in a moment. It, it's, it's the ability to go, I don't feel God, but I know what God said. I haven't seen the breakthrough yet, thought I would have had it a few weeks ago. Here I am, and now I'm going to trust God. That's patience. And, and I know that we preach a lot on faith, but it is impossible to inherit the promises of God without both faith and patience. And I'm just telling you, in my own life, walking with God all these years, everything that God has promised me has taken longer than I thought. But I was raised in Pentecost, and in Pentecost, God's in a hurry. We got to get this done. God's in a hurry. And I've just found out I don't know who they're preaching about because he is just not in a hurry. <laughs> He's patient. He's long-suffering. He's on his own time clock. And the moment I can embrace that is the moment I can have joy in the waiting. Patience is the ability to God to believe God beyond the frustration of the waiting, patience will be required. And the more that I can embrace this and know that it's just gonna be a part of my life, the sooner I can be joyful while I'm waiting on the breakthrough. Number two, hope must be practiced. I've never used this phrase before. This, this phrase came to me a few weeks ago, and I've been, I've been meditating on it. Hope must be practiced. There is a, there is a discipline to hope. There's an art form to hope. There's a, there's a practicing to hope. Hope is not just a feeling of, I hope it gets better. 
It is living in an expectation of what God is about to do and living in such a way that I'm believing for a better future, speaking for a better future, praying for a better future, making decisions today for a better future. Think about this. Jesus enters into Bethany and here's Mary and Martha's first words. Lord, if you'd have been here. They immediately start rehearsing what was. Think about this. Instead of practicing hope, they're practicing the past. Instead of going, Lord, you're here. Praise God. They immediately begin to accuse God. They immediately begin to, begin to rehearse what was. And, and they're frustrated with God. Let me just say this. What, what I've come to know about my own life is that when I'm mad at God and frustrated at God, I've learned that I'm also frustrated with me. So I'm saying, Lord, if you would have been here, but in reality, I'm going, man, if I wouldn't have done that, man, if I would have done this, man, if I would have said this, if I wouldn't have said that, if I, if I would have signed with them, if I wouldn't have done that, if I would have married them, if I wouldn't have married them, if I would have done this, if I, and we end up in a place of regret. Man, if only I would have bought Bitcoin at a dollar and sold it at 60,000. Man, we should have bought a house when it was 2.4 interest. Man, I should have, man, I should have done that. Man, I shouldn't have signed with that. Man, I should have went in that career. I, and, and we say we're mad at God, but we're really mad at ourselves. And I think Mary and Martha were really mad at themselves because they're thinking, man, instead of sending a messenger, maybe we should have went and grabbed Jesus. Maybe we should have sent the, the letter a few days before, maybe. And they're living in a place of their past. And friend, I just got to tell you something. You can't change your past. You can learn from it, but you can't change it. Listen, your past can be a teacher, but it is a terrible leader. Your past can instruct you, but you cannot let it master you. Learn the lesson and move on because it doesn't matter how bad you feel about it, you cannot change it. And most believers are not practicing hope. They're living in their past. Good or bad, they're living in what was. Many believers are not just living in regret. They're just living in the good old days, the glory days of what was. Remember in Isaiah 43, there's a real famous scripture where God said, behold, I'm doing a new thing. And, and, and we love to preach that to people who are maybe going through a rough season. We go, hey, God's going to do a new thing in your life. But the context of that is actually miracles. God goes, remember when I delivered you? Remember when I set you free? Remember when I brought you through the, through the rivers? Remember when I, when I delivered you from your enemies? And the children of Israel are going, yeah, I remember that. And God goes, forget all that. I'm doing a new thing. Because even good memories... Can I get an amen from somebody in this room? Even good memories can stop you. Even a good thing can be your ceiling that you don't believe God passed. But we serve the God of hope. We serve the God of the future. We serve the God of the best is yet to come. That we're going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I learned my lesson. I saw what God did. But now I'm moving on. Because I am staring at the resurrection and the life. And I refuse to be bound to what was. People of hope refuse to be limited by what was. But you have to practice hope. And hope feels weird and hope feels awkward because you have no emotional connection to your future. So most of us end up being anchored to our past because we know our past. We know the feeling of our past. We know the sounds of our past. We know the emotions of our past. But the scripture promises us in Hebrews 9 that we can be anchored to hope. Which means the, the base foundational emotion of my life is not regret, it's expectation. Oh my God. The base foundational emotion of my life is not what could have been. It's what's God about to do. You know the scripture promises in the Old Testament that we can be prisoners of hope. What a beautiful thought that I don't have to be a prisoner of my past. I could be bound, anchored, imprisoned to my future. But see, this is hard to practice. It's awkward because we haven't seen it yet. Think, think about what pastor is doing right now, what this church is doing right now. We're about to build this 
beautiful lobby. About to build this beautiful gym. It's, it's, it is for the school, but it's way more for, than the school. It's a connection for our next generation. It's hope. It's not religious, but it's future. It doesn't sound very spiritual. We need a bigger auditorium for souls. No, we need a place for souls to meet other souls and to connect outside of... You know that if you go to any old school traditional um, denominational church of any denomination in America, if you go to an old building, you're going to find big auditoriums and tiny lobbies. But they're telling us now people need connection. So here's the difference. Now they're telling us when we build buildings that our lobbies need to be as big as our auditoriums. 40% of every person who attends a church, 40% of them only attend that church because of the friend group that they've made. Now that's really hard for a preacher to hear. Amen. Because we think you're coming for the anointing. Hallelujah. But you just come for your friends. But guess what? It's important. So we're going to build a lobby out here. So you have a place to connect. So you have, so our kids have a place to meet other kids and our teenagers have a place to meet other teenagers where we can build friendships and we can, it's hope. Do we need it? It's hope. We're going to build a gym for the next generation. It doesn't look spiritual, but it's very spiritual. Because we need houses of hope, cities on hills where our teenagers and our children can come, where they can receive ministry, where they love this church, where they love to go to that play place, where, they, where they're going to love to go to the gym, where they're going to connect with friends and family and other. It's, it's ministry. It's ministry for the people of God. But it's hope. Because our, our religious mindset doesn't want us to do that. Our religious mindset just wants us to, to do more in here. But this is important. But then after this, after the glory falls in here, we have to go out there and get a cup of coffee and meet people and actually build relationships and be sustained and build friendships that go beyond Sunday morning where we meet people and go to dinner, meet people and go to lunch, meet people and go to join small groups and diff different connections. So we, we have to do this, but it's hope. It's future. It's the place that our kids and our grandkids and, yes, even our great-grandkids will fill. Wow. It's hope. So hope feels awkward because I don't have an emotional connection yet to it. Let me, let me explain it this. A couple of months ago, I had a, a meeting with my doctor. He was very rude. He was very rude. <laughs> Y'all ever met a rude doctor? Hey, Amen. You got a rude doctor? Yeah, he's rude. He was rude to me. If you're a doctor in here, we love you. But I was, I was very offended. So every year I get my little physical, and every year it's the same thing. Hey, you need to lose a little weight, but you're healthy. Oh, praise God. Well, I'm not going to change anything. Amen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> well, this year was different. He goes, your, your kidneys are dry, and you got cholesterol, and you got blah, blah. And he just starts naming all these things. I said, get behind me, Satan. So I've been changing my diet over these last two months. I've lost 28 pounds, and I got about 50 to go, and so... Don't clap too. I don't want to be too encouraged. I still got a lot to lose. And so, uh, so, um, so I'm on this journey and I'm doing all this dieting stuff and counting calories and I'm not eating gluten and sugar and blah, blah, blah. And so, um, so it, it's been good. But uh, I went to dinner a couple of nights ago and I opened the menu. And I don't know, it just, my eyes just... And I went right to the fried chicken on the menu. Amen. 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 And when I read it, I saw it. Because I have a, I have a connection to it. Because this is body by fried chicken. Amen. This is, uh, fried chicken is my testimony. Amen. So when I read fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and greens, I saw it. No, I saw it. I saw the fried chicken up top. It was a beautiful circular plate. Amen. I never saw it, but I saw it. Because that, that's how easy it is to get in prison to your pet. You just see it. So I saw the fried chicken up top. It was three pieces. Don't tell me why it was three pieces. But in my mind, it was a, it, it was a, it was a breast, a thigh, and a wing. Amen. That's how I saw it. It was mashed potatoes and gravy to the left, and it was greens to the right. I saw the whole thing. 
and it's all I wanted to order. But I ordered a salad. It was awful. It was awful. <laughs> and I'm not eating gluten, so I ordered the salad with no croutons. He goes, sir, this is fresh made, homemade bread, and we make the croutons every morning. I said, keep your mouth shut, sir. <laughs> Give me a salad with no croutons before I stab you with my fork. And so I ate. Watch this, watch this. I was practicing hope. I wasn't eating it for the pleasure of the moment. I was eating it for my future. Because I'd like to walk my daughter down the aisle one day and I'd like to not have heart disease and I'd like to not fight the, the things that have been in the Chavez family line of cancer and, and different heart issues. So, so I'm eating a salad and I didn't like it. But I'm practicing for my future. I'm practicing for where I want to go and how I want to look and the health I want to have. So I had to eat in my present what I did not want, though I had an emotional, I knew what the fried chicken tastes like and what it's going to sound like and the crunch it's going to have and the texture it's going to have and everything in me wanted that, but I had to eat a salad, not because of where I've been or where I'm at, but because of where I want to go. This is hope. It is the expectation of where I'm going. I'm not making decisions for today. I'm making decisions for tomorrow. We're building that gym for tomorrow. We're building that lobby for tomorrow. We're doing new campuses for tomorrow. We're, we're helping more souls for tomorrow. We may never see it with our physical eyes, but we're, we're setting up the next generation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's hope. It's hope. And this is what God is promising us. Martha immediately begins to rehearse the past. Jesus immediately begins to talk about the future. She says, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus immediately gets her to start thinking future. And I just want, I just want to ask, I want you to wrestle with this today. What does my conversation sound like? Is it all wrapped up in what was? Or am I beginning to talk about what could be in God? That's hope. Thirdly, I'll have the team come up. Gratitude is your strength. Gratitude is your strength. Gratitude is your strength. Gratitude is your strength. Jesus approaches the burial site of Lazarus and here is his prayer. Father, I thank you. What a prayer. This is my favorite prayer in Scripture. Father, I thank you that you heard me and that you always hear me. Woo, what a prayer to pray. Because after I've said it, it's time to start thanking God for it. I'm not saying you can't pray for something two, three, four times, a hundred times. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying after the initial request has been made, it is time to add thanksgiving to your prayers. Father, I thank you that you heard me. When did God hear him? I don't know. Did Jesus pray that prayer on day one, day two, day three, or day four? I don't know. But now they're on day four. Lazarus is four days dead, and Jesus is still thanking God, the Father, that the Father has already heard the prayer. This is the power of gratitude. This is the power of a thank you. Paul would tell the church of Philippi 16 times, rejoice. Are you on a mountaintop? Rejoice. In a valley low? Rejoice. Heaven on earth? Rejoice. Hell on earth? Rejoice. How can I rejoice? Because I'm rejoicing in the Lord, not in my circumstance. Always. Well, that's easy for Paul to say he was an apostle. He wrote that from prison. He wasn't in the penthouse suite of the Mayo Hotel in downtown Tulsa. He's in a jail cell saying, rejoice. Because that rejoicing is going to keep you, it's going to keep you humble on the mountain and it's going to keep you encouraged in the valley. Rejoice because it's going to keep you holy when you're tempted. Rejoice because it's going to keep you godly whenever you're going through something. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Rejoicing will keep you connected to the Father. Rejoice. That word rejoice is one of my favorite little Greek words. Here's what it means. Lean into favor oh my god 
What did, what, did the, what did the proverb writer warn us of? Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on what's going on in the world. Don't, it, we should be informed, but don't be obsessed about what's happening. Be informed, but don't be obsessed. I watch about 10 minutes of the news. That's all I can handle if I want to be saved. Can I get it? Yeah, okay. So I watch about 10 minutes. I'll catch a little bit of Tucker, a little bit of Hannity, whatever I might watch. And I watch about 10 minutes and I get the, I get the feel for what's going on in the world. And then I turn it off. Because if I start leaning on that, it's going to be one depressed preacher. I, I'm building a building right now. Lord, how are we going to build a building? It's a, it's a recession. It's a depression. It's a stagflation. It's an inflation. It's a gas prices. It's a shortage. It's a this. It's a that. It's a... If I start leaning that way, whew. I'm not in denial of it. We got wars, rumors of wars. We got inflation. We got, we got gas prices. We got mortgage rate. I mean, you name it, we got it. <laughs> but I'm not leaning on that. I'm not in denial of it. It's real. I'm just not, that can't be my strength right now. So here's what I'm doing. I'm rejoicing. I'm leaning into favor. Lord, you're the God of famines. You're the God who provided for Abram in the famine. You're the God who provided for Isaac in the famine. Lord, you're the hundredfold God that provides for your people in the Lord, you're the God of the famine. Lord, you're the God who sustained Elijah in a famine. You're the God who sustained Elisha in a drought. God, I'm leaning into favor. Come on, stuff. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost right now. I'm telling somebody, God is your source. God is your provider. I'm not in denial of the mountain, but I'm going to talk to the mountain. I'm going to lean on favor, and I'm going to say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to history. I'm rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. God's going to take you. I know what the doctor said, but God's my healer. I know what's happening in the economy, but God's my provider. I know what my teenager just told me, but God said, me and my whole household shall be saved. And I'm leaning. How do I rejoice? Here's how you rejoice. You rejoice by rehearsing. What do I rehearse? Anything good and anything God. I'm leaning towards favor. Oof. I'm just staying here. Why are you bent over? You're back out? Nope, just leaning towards favor. I'm just, I'm going to face in the direction of the goodness of God. Isn't that what Daniel did when he prayed in the book of Daniel? Didn't he face east? Because he said, I just need to face the presence of God. I got to build an altar. I, I, I got to face the direction of the presence of the Lord, and I just got to stay there. Oh, I'm in Babylon, but I'm facing east. Oh, oh we're going through it right now, but I'm facing the presence of God. I know America is in, is in whatever it's in, but I'm in an altar. I know things are going crazy, but I built an altar. I, it, might be, it might be crazy all around me, but Psalm 91 said it's, it's crazy all around me, but it won't touch me because I built an altar. I'm in, I'm in the heart of Babylon, literally Las Vegas, Nevada, but I'm facing east. <laughs> I'm facing the presence of God. I'm facing, I'm, I'm leaning towards favor in every area of my life. Be anxious for nothing. Wow, that, that, that doesn't sound easy. It's not, but you can, you can live. You can live with an anxious for nothing spirit. How do I do that, Javen? I'd love to know that. I'd pay you a million dollars to find that out. No, no, it's free. It's right here. In everything by prayer and supplication. If you're thinking about it, pray about it. If you're worried about it, pray about it. If it's on your heart, pray about it. If it's in your mind, talk about it. Be anxious for nothing. Here's how you break anxiety with prayer, supplication. And here's the beautiful part with thanksgiving. Father, I thank you. You know that neuroscientists have now taught us that anxiety and gratitude cannot take up the same space of your brain. That the, the thanksgiving and the grat the Father, I thank you that you heard me, will push anxiety right out of your soul. 
Thanksgiving is a weapon in the hand of the believer. Can I, prom- can, I, can I just show you one promise real quick? I just got to prove this to you. Psalm 149, this is not in my notes. Psalm 149 says it like this. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Let a double-edged sword be in their hand to inflict vengeance on their enemies. That with the high praises of God in our mouth, we literally, it is maybe your greatest expression of warfare is praising God. It's not casting out the devil. It's going, it's going, devil, I'm not even going to mess with you. I'm going to let God fight my battles. God, I thank you. Devil, you're already under my feet, but I'm not going to give you another moment. Father, I thank you. (laughs) I thank you that you heard me. I thank you that you're the God who answers by fire. I thank you that you're the God who heals. I thank you that you're the God who delivers and the God. Father, I thank you. And that gratitude and that praise begins to inflict vengeance on my enemies. It begins to bring freedom to the captive. It begins to push anxiety out of my heart. Father, I, and you don't have to sing good and you don't have to be super spiritual spiritual but every person in this room can have a grateful heart every person in this room can lift up a father I thank you some of you can sing it others of you got to shout it some of you men even if you could just whisper it father I I thank you that my children will serve God I thank you that this cancer is being healed I thank you that you're going to provide for me in famine I thank you that my back is being healed I thank you that my body is coming into alignment with the word of God I thank you that our marriage is getting better I thank you that I'm going to get into that college I thank you that God's going to give me I thank you patience hope and gratitude these things will not only help you to see answers to prayer but here's even more important they'll give you the attitude that will sustain you in every season if you're facing a Lazarus situation right now you need Lazarus to come forth maybe it's in an area of your marriage maybe finance maybe Maybe you need a miracle in your business. Maybe it's something going on physically in your body. I want to tell you, Jesus is the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still healing. He is still setting free. He is still delivering. He's still answering prayer. If you need a Lazarus come forth in your life, would you just lift your hands all over this room? And Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Before I even pray, can you say that out loud? Say, Father, I thank you. Come on, say it one more time. Father, I thank you. (laughs) One more time, Father, I thank you. Now just just let a thank you just rise real quick because God's about to hear your prayer. God has heard your prayer. God has seen your request. We've made our request known to God. And now with Thanksgiving, Father, I thank you. I thank you that healing and virtue is flowing. I thank you that wisdom is flowing. Ideas are flowing. Where there has been a wall, where there has been a ceiling, where there has been a boundary line that the devil has set up, I thank you that right now we're pushing past that boundary. I thank you that we are expanding the borders of our tent right now. I thank you that you're expanding our heart and our mind and our creativity. Father, I thank you that Lazarus is coming up out of the grave right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you that dead things are coming back to life. I thank you that answers are falling on your people right now. I thank you that we will look back on this day. We will look back on this summer and say the tide of the battle turned. Something shifted in our family. Something moved in our life. We were never the same. Father, I thank you. And while we're waiting on the answer, we lean into favor. We rejoice and we thank you that you heard our prayer in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room and you do not know the Lord, you don't know Christ, you've never given your life to Christ, you feel far from God. Some of you feel backslidden, you've you've walked away from the Lord, you need to come home, pray with me now. Pray with me now all over the room. Give your life to Christ. Every person out loud say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I give you my life. And I declare, Jesus is Lord of my life. Still no one moving, no one looking, but right where you're at, right where you're at, right where you're standing. I'm not going to. 
I'm not going to embarrass you today, but right where you're standing, Jabin, that's me. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Jabin, that's me. I'm rededicating my life to Christ. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand high enough and long enough because I want to acknowledge you right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make a scene of you, but you know who you are. Jabin, this is my day. I want to publicly confess my faith in Christ. I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm giving my life back to Christ. If that's you in this room right now, one, two, three, shoot your hand up, shoot your hand up. If that's you, I see 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 you. I see you, I see you all the way in the back. I see you, 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 I see you there, I see you there. Anybody else, anybody else, I see you right here. Anyone else, I see you right there. Anybody else, anybody else, so many people. I see you, I see you. Beautiful, beautiful. I see you right there over here to my left. Anybody, right here, one, two, three, back there. I see you guys, I see you right here, sir. Anybody else, anybody else. High and, high and long enough that I know who, who, I'm, who, I'm, who I just prayed with. Anybody, so many souls coming to Christ right now. Anybody else? You could put your hands down. Let me ask a second group. Javen, I didn't raise my hand, and I should have. Go ahead right now. I see you. Anybody else? I did not raise my hand, but I was supposed to. I see you, sir, right here. I see you, ma'am, right here. Anybody else? Sir, right here. Beautiful, beautiful. So many souls coming to Christ right now. Anybody else? I'm from Vegas, so I'm going to give you one more chance before I get on this airplane. I should have raised my hand, and I didn't. Is there even one more hand that needs to be raised right now? Can I? High enough and long enough for me to see. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see you. Anybody else? Javen, if you just give me one more chance, I'd lift my hand. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise God, praise God. Friends, let's celebrate. So many people today saying, I wanna, I wanna follow Jesus. Woo, glory. I love you, church.